4.3 billion people live across this vast continent called Asia. And we are telling their stories. On this edition, Desperate Times, many Pakistanis have relied on the sea to make money. But this tradition is all but drying up. Making a call the old-fashioned way. We travel to the remote Indian village where everyone's name is a song. And the last of her kind, how an old art in the Philippines could die out along with its last artist. I'm Daniel Khan and this is a Simon Asia. Welcome to the program. Pakistan is a country deeply rooted in tradition. Millions of people make a living the same way their ancestors did generations ago. But changing times means life is not as simple as it used to be. And many people today are struggling to keep traditional practices alive. John Hussain remembers happier times. For decades, he and his family made their living from these waters. There was an abundance of fish, crabs and prawns. But a little over 20 years ago, things started to change. And today, John says, there's so much worse. I used to accompany my father on this same boat. It has worn out now. Hm. Those were the good days. Today, no traces of prosperity are left in this area. It seems the fish have disappeared. John barely earns a dollar a day, far less than he needs to feed a family of ten. Last night, my children slept without food. The babies didn't stop crying and I couldn't sleep. Sometimes I think of committing suicide, but then what will become of my children? I cannot do this to them. At times, I go for days and return empty-handed. I feel I have lost the battle against life. And his story is all too common among fishers in this community, along the creeks of the Indus Delta. A combination of big business and local corruption has left them living far below the poverty line. There is a lot of fish in the sea, but now bigger commercial ships and trawlers clean sweep the fish with dangerous nets. It is damaging this industry. These creeks are breeding grounds for fish, and when the large nets are thrown in the water, the smallest hatching are also caught. Sometimes John gets work as a handyman on one of the bigger motorized fishing boats. Here, he can earn a proper day's wage. But with only sporadic employment, John and his family struggle just to survive. We do not have clean drinking water. We can only dream of having electricity. Our children are suffering from all sorts of diseases. We have no access to hospitals. Women give birth in their homes. It seems the government has forgotten about us. In the times gone by, Tata was a bustling town with a population of a little over 200,000 people. In the rich fields that surrounded the town, farmers grew coconut rice, mangoes and guavas. But devastating floods, followed by famine, erased much of that prosperity. Thousands of farmers lost their livestock and their land. They were forced to leave their traditional way of life and find new ways to earn money in bigger cities. In Karachi's harbour, John Hussain's brother Sada did so by abandoning one tradition and learning another, building boats for Pakistan's rich. He's done well for himself since migrating here 20 years ago. I've tried hard to convince my brother to come here. Maybe it's hard for him to let go and begin from scratch. But I'm glad I came. 
though living in the city has its downside as well, living is expensive. Intricately crafted and painted, each hand-carved boat and yacht is one of a kind. Sada is known as one of the best craftsmen in the harbour. By the grace of God, my business flourishes all year round. When I am not building a boat, I paint them. And when there is no painting, I go fish in the sea. But Sada's future is threatened too. This traditional craft he worked so hard to master is being threatened by modernity. An increasing number of boat owners prefer vessels made of fiberglass and other more durable materials. That's left the yard where craftsmen build traditional boats somewhat deserted. Still, Sada and his team put their hearts and souls into every one they make. A complex mixture of art, architecture and engineering that takes months, sometimes years, to complete. The boat makers say royal families from the Middle Eastern countries still buy these traditional houseboats and yachts. A craftsman can make about two to three thousand dollars just for a single piece, but only the finest few are hired for the job. But those less skilled have had to give up the craft. And with business slowing, Sada accepts he'll eventually have to too. I'm prepared for the worst. I can always go back to my village, to my brother, to my family. But if the government supports us, maybe build an institution for us. We can teach this art to the next generation and prevent it from dying out. With no such support, many boat makers have had to return to their villages to wallow in the conditions they had once left behind taking to the waters to catch fish once again, even if they're lucky enough to get a decent catch. This local landowner says they lose out in a selling system where the middleman takes the lion's share. They buy for a very small uh, rate and they sell it in the market for a higher rate. So I think that uh, by this way, they were deprived from them, from their right. So what is the government doing to help uh, the uh, poor community of fishermen? I think nothing. In this area, they haven't done anything. Not so, says Sain Baksh from the Forest Department of Sindh province. He says the local authority has been helping the fishers by growing mangroves along the creeks of the Indus Delta. The livelihood of this coastal community is flourishing because of the presence of these mangroves. They are the breeding grounds of fish, shrimp, lobsters, prawns and other seafood. But Baksh acknowledges issues beyond the local government's control are taking a toll on the people. One of the major problems we face is that the Indus Delta receives very little fresh water. Because of the enormous amount of erosion in the north, silt keeps depositing in the water. Secondly, industries are dumping wastewater into the sea, and that's not only damaging the mangroves, but also harming marine life. It wasn't supposed to be this way. Pakistan has been leasing land in this area to the government of Dubai since the late 1970s. In exchange, Dubai was to provide funds for services like education and health care for the local people. Kaloro himself has been trying to make a difference, using his influence to get the government of Dubai to fund a pilot project. Recently, the government of Dubai have started one program that we are supporting the uh, ladies as they are, have the fun of swing and uh, handmade uh, release and this is something local uh, sheets, bed sheets and all. So I started, they started with the program. I suggest uh, to the government of the world, it is better that we should give them a, a sewing machines and then they should, whatever they 
make it, we should buy to improve the general condition of the people. A small but important amount of aid that is giving this poor community a glimmer of hope. But John Hussain says so much more needs to be done. Illegal fishing practices and pollution continues with little or no check from authorities. That leaves fishers like himself with little alternatives. At 58, John says he's too old to learn new skills. Leaving for another city is out of the question. I was born here, my roots are here, and even if I do leave, what will I do in the big city? I am a common fisherman, I can't do anything else. This is my life, and the life of my children. They too will become fishermen like me. So as his family helps him untangle his net to prepare for the next day, they can only pray John will be able to catch enough fish for them to get by. There is one group that is trying to help the boat makers that you saw in that report. It's trying to appeal to the government to make boat making an official sector that would give these craftsmen better financial guarantees to keep the tradition alive. But as of now, they are still on their own. Coming up next on Assignment Asia, a unique oral tradition that people in this Indian village are fighting to keep relevant. Our stories this week look at traditions and people in one village high in the mountains of India have a truly special way to call each other. But as Pearly Jacob explains, modern times and technology are challenging the need to keep up the centuries-old practice. A chorus of roosters greets the new day. But in this small village in the northeast of India, their calls aren't the only ones that fill the air. A lady sings out to her neighbor. But this call has a much deeper meaning. Each short tune is unique, and each one represents a person. It's a kind of secondary name that people here use throughout their lives. Every villager in Gong Tong has one. It's called Jing Rai Yao Bei. Jingwai means the song, and Yobe means our grandmother. And this song has been composed for the newborn baby by mother or father. And because in our society, we are a matrilineal society, so we are, this song also we are dedicated to our grandmother. That's why we call in Kasi the Jingwai Yobe. Community leader Rothel Kongset is a new father who's just finished composing a song for his baby boy. <laughs> Rothel says composing a Jung Rai Yao Bei is an important rite of passage for parents and it serves as a symbolic bond with their children. Even more so than their actual names, Parents use the tunes to call their children from infancy to old age. <laughs> it's a centuries old tradition invented for practical purposes. According to the tale of our grandmother, before as our belief that uh, in the jungles we cannot call somebody's name. Maybe some coos, they are living in the jungles or in the rivers, so they might know your name or my name. 
if the course know my name and then they will take my name and then I might get uh, ill Oi. and maybe I will die. So to, to protect from that, instead of calling his or her name, they compose this in Wayabe and you know, they, instead of calling by names, they used to call by this in Wayabe and the course also, they don't know whose song belongs to, to whom, they don't know. People today aren't so superstitious, but Jingwa Yaobei is still a common way to communicate in a place where most people farm and gather forest produce in the steep hills to earn a living. And back in the village, Jingwa Yaobei is still the best way to call children to come home. The tunes of Jingrai Yaobei can still be heard across Gongtong village. But life here is changing. New cash crops like broom grass have replaced traditional food crops, bringing in money and modern communication tools. The village elders fear Jingwa Yaobei may soon die out. Uh, now it is instead of calling by their names, by this by this Jingwa Yaobei, I mean, we used to call by their mobile. Huh? But Jingwa Yaobei is a tradition villagers in Kong Tong want to keep alive. So Rothel and other villagers have come up with an ambitious goal. They want to turn their community, which for centuries has been isolated from much of the world, into a destination for tourists from across India and beyond. The key to maintaining their ancient local customs, they say, is to make it relevant. Doing that means teaching their way of life to visitors from outside. But such a dramatic change can't happen yeah. overnight. So far, only a handful of researchers and journalists have visited this village, which remains extremely hard to get to. A route to the village didn't even exist until 2013, and it remains far from complete. But progress, though slow, is being made. A few villagers recently formed a cooperative and are building a guest house in the traditional Kasi design. They hope it will attract tourists to come and stay for days at a time. We don't realize that this is you know, a way of ours that the people will know. And after the people coming for, you know, for, for interviewing and for, you know, for doing research, we are surprised that this our culture is, has been popular this much. So that's why you know, we are realized now that we should preserve and we should you know, promote them so that the people, they will know. And we also, the people of this village, we, we should practice uh, uh, from generation to generation. It's not certain if promoting their culture can be a successful economic model for Gong Tong. But trying to do so gives their local customs and Jingwa Yaobei a reason to survive. A unique tradition these people want to share with others. After all, there aren't many corners of the world where people can claim their name is a song. For Assignment Asia, this is Pearly Jacob in Gong Tong Village in the northeast Indian state of Meghalaya. There's no doubt that bringing tourism to the so-called singing village will boost the local economy. But if more visitors come, will this musical tradition be the main attraction or fade away? We'll have to see. Now stay with us after the break. We'll take you to the Philippines and meet the sole survivor of an ancient art. Artists and craftspeople often have apprentices to teach their skills to, so the tradition can be passed down from one generation to the next. But in the Philippines, the ancient tattooing art of Batuk is down to its last surviving artist. Video journalist Peter Carne met her and the young girl who plans to keep the tradition going.
Sakum, <laughs> Nila khoya khot, kiri kaya man, kirab tab khot. Nai, kiri na chujug. Achu pailayang ah, nalisayin. Uga ta uwey nan alingga. Saad na intuyong na khoto, malab hutap pila. Itchong ta anon. No, I see the wrong hot me put around. Then she can get a sapuyan with a rub crab who then hot she got ta. In Bogasara, Nalab who at Kusahato. Such is a chummies a sapuyan me. Natuid, Natuid and no hot or tongue again. Natuid on her hot or chubater. Natuid and more hot or luhu. Agustina vincaba tu con un mosa. Se de mujer va a no hoja to no. Me de crisis en nave ni supli me como hoja to cosayan. Yo va a no crisis mi suat. Sachiaran. Corri cariño. Nung nagsimula kasi si Apo, parang uh, may gan ganun pala, parang nasabi ko. Gusto ko rin maging gan kagaya niya, nasabi ko. Tapos nung nagtato ko ng mga kaibigan ko, kaya ko pala. Oo naman, proud ako kasi ako yung magtutuloy ng culture namin. Ako yung parang mag... mag Maging isang mag mambabatok din katulad ni Apo. Kasi noon kasi parang pag nagtatu ka, may tatu ka, ikaw ay very beautiful, di ba? Matatanda kasi parang nagsimula silang nagpatatu nung sila ay nine, ten. Ay sinasabi, mina, sinasabi namin na anong... Pakiramdam, pakiramdam ng dalawang araw lang, ay tatlong araw lang, tuloy-tuloy. Sinasabi, hindi kami makapaniwala. Tapos sinasabi lang, gusto namin, iwe, kaya niyo? <laughs> Noon kasi, parang naitulong niya, no? parang hindi ako kayang humarap ng tao, ganon. Kasi hindi ako sanay maki, makisalamuha. Ngayon na nag ano nakikisalamuha ako sa ibang tao. Sana dumami sila pumunta dito para makilala ay makita nila itong barangay namin. Tapos para hindi mawala yung kultura namin na mag mangbabatok.
Ang kukunin ko, kukunin ko yung sinimula niya, tapos ako yung huli. Asi, kaya kayo, uba itnan nila, uba suta data, asi, kaya kayo. Pigsa. <laughs> Batok symbolizes both beauty and strength. But this ancient art form could very well fade away long before the tattoos themselves do. You can learn more about this and all the stories on today's program on our website, assignment-asia.com. Share your thoughts and contribute story ideas for future shows by contacting us at our social media handles. That's all the time we have for this week. I'm Daniel Khan. Thanks for watching and join us again on Assignment Asia.